Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Leadership Series. And today, I am very excited to introduce you to Gail Bannock. Gail is a passionate retail executive and a transformational leader of high-performance teams. She has deep experience in omnichannel retail, global brand marketing, and consumer insights. Most recently, she was the Senior Vice President of Kids, Baby, and Family Entertainment at Indigo and Lead Merchant for Indigo Kids and Indigo Baby, responsible for omni-channel growth through product development and merchandise strategy. Okay, so that is a mouthful because you have such incredible experience, but Gail, I would love, you know, we're also, a, we're a business that's focused around family. So I'd love to know more about you, your kids, and then of course, a better understanding of a lot of the things in your title that are pretty impressive. Perfect. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Sharon. I'm so happy to be here. Um, well, listen, I am a mom of three. I have three kids. The oldest is 18, just turned 18, a 12 year old uh, and a seven year old. So a lot of, uh, a, you know, gap, big gaps between them, which has yeah. allowed me to kind of be in three different stages at any given time. I would always be able to, you know, go from changing diapers and talking about animals to then talking about space to then talking about boys. It was always very, uh, very entertaining before bed at nighttime. Um, but other than that, uh, I my experience kind of over the last 19 years has been a lot of retail, a lot of uh, CPG as well, and ranging from customer insights and research search and strategy all the way to marketing and then most recently merchandising and merchandising being buying. So my team was essentially responsible for the decisions around what Indigo carried and didn't carry. Um, so that's what uh, over 19 years that basically sums it up. Oh my gosh, 19 years. That's a lot and three kids in there. And I know when you and I initially chatted, I think we went on a tangent about kids and we decided that that's going to have to do, that's going to have to be an entirely other interview oh, because Lord. that took us like 45 minutes to an hour. Well, I think, I think there's a lot to say. There's a lot to say when you have three kids. There is. And, and also when it. you're balancing the three kids and you're balancing an incredibly successful career that requires a ton of work. So kudos to you as a fellow working mom. Thank you. Same to you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to get into our first question. So you've spent a lot of your career in the insight space. So how would you say insights play a role throughout the entire product life cycle in the organizations you've worked for? So I think insights can play as small or big of a role as you let them. And I think, you know, there's analysis paralysis, there's too much information, but I think there are some very key areas where it really benefits you as a business to understand your customer, understand what they want, understand what they need, understand what they don't want, um, and make sure that your product is in line. So when I was at Spin Master, for example, we, my team and I managed to insert ourselves into every single part of the product development cycle, everything wow. from idea in conception to product, early product testing to see if the product was breaking at any point or was not appealing to our customers all the way to testing ads and then testing the brand awareness and consideration once we launched the brand and it was particularly important and i think it's particularly important in in your space which it where the end user and the customer are not the same and so in in, in some cases i often add there's grandparents in, in there and aunts and uncles. And so sometimes the person selecting the product, paying for the product and using the product are completely different. And so it's really important to make sure that you check in with all of them to make sure that your communication strategy matches the right customer and the product actually matches the right customer. Yeah, so I mean, it's a lot of trial and error. We come across a lot of new brands. And I think, you know, the whole reason we started this leadership interview series is because there's so many new brands that just, they don't have an understanding and they don't have the resources ultimately in order to understand all of the things 
that they don't understand, right? From a retail perspective, from a developing of a new product. So understanding all of the steps that you guys were involved in, the trial and error to ultimately, you know, same thing as we do afterwards is we're testing the product. Like you guys can test it in a lab and you can test it with an R&D team, but ultimately the people who are buying that product and their kids are dropping it or throwing it and how many times can they do that before it breaks? And also, is it a product that people are going to want to continue using and recommending to others? Because that's the most important stage once you've finished yeah. developing it when it comes to the insights, right? Absolutely. But, and I think you can be scrappy. I think you, yeah. you know, when, again, when I was at Spin Master, it was very scrappy. We didn't have, a, I didn't have a, a large budget. And oftentimes, you know, eventually after seeing kids interact with product over and over, you get a sense and, and yeah. a lot of, you know, founders get a sense of, you can, you know, little hands. If you're talking about a, a toddler's hands, you know, their dexterity, you know, what they can and can't do, what they can lift, what they can, you know, what, what is impossible for them and what um, wouldn't be satisfying for them in a product. So I think you can, you can test and learn and you can watch and observe, but you also have, have to think about it from their perspective. Yeah, a hundred percent. And as moms, we know that when we've gone out and made purchases, the products that we tend to recommend tend to be the ones that have had a lot of longevity, have, if it's a toy, have kept our kids inter, well, back in the day, kept our kids entertained for a long period of time, right? Because that's when you feel like you've really gotten the value for your dollar ultimately. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So now when developing products, how do you ensure that a product is going to resonate ultimately with its target audience? Well, I think it's important to uh, stay educated, keep yourself educated on trends. So again, when we were developing product at Indigo most recently, um, it was very trend focused. So it was uh, making sure, you know, when we did our summer collection of towels and we're developing towels for or ponchos for three to five year olds, you know, knowing when unicorns are out and butterflies are in and knowing when, you know, trucks are out and dinosaurs are in is really important. And obviously Obviously, you know, these are these are important decisions because at that age, even though kids are really young, they're making decisions. And I think more and more millennial parents are allowing their kids to make more and more of the buying decisions early right. on. To your point, they don't want to buy anything that then the child doesn't use and they waste their money. So they, they have their kids very involved. And so it's really important to know what's cool, what's fun, what's interesting um, so that it resonates. So, so I think staying I in touch. Being- I could not be involved in product development because my kids tell me that I am so not on trend. Um, But clearly that's incredibly important because you're right. Like parents these days are, I I remember buying things for my kids and not asking their opinions. Now it is a whole process. The kids are shopping online with the parents. There's a lot of influence that is happening with every single purchasing decision, even from a really young age. Are you finding that? Absolutely. Well, first, I don't claim to be the expert. I was not the expert. My team yeah. was on top of it and making sure that they knew what was cool, looking at competitors. And, and to be, I just want to clarify for your listeners, it's not that you have to go and buy some fancy, you know, macro trend, you know, right. something. It is about looking around what are the your competitors who might actually be buying those fancy trends? What are they doing? What are the similarities that you're finding between them? Suddenly, you know, for us, you know, is Pottery Barn, Target, and, you know, um, I don't know, another retail, are they suddenly all you know, coming up with mermaids, yeah. is that a theme now? So it, again, I just want to make sure nobody thinks they have to go and do anything fancy. It's really just looking around and making sure that you're aware of the trends and what's happening. But I couldn't agree with you more. I think I used to buy things for my kids and they wouldn't have an opinion. And I think uh, even for my younger kid now, um, that was true for my oldest, but now right. 12 years later, um, th- he absolutely has an opinion. And I think we should never underestimate our kids are exposed to a lot of media and they are they are the most educated consumers out there they are bombarded with ads on youtube they are they're seeing a lot they talk to each other and so they are very very 
very educated on what is cool, what is hot, what is not okay, and even from a very, very young age. I, I'll never forget my first branding experience with my daughter. So this was 17 years ago. We were walking through Walmart and she called, she couldn't speak. She couldn't even say mama, I, I, I barely. And she pointed to Dora on Band-Aids when we were walking through and she could identify that license yeah. and that brand. Yeah. And I, I couldn't even, I didn't, I don't even know how, but that was, you know, I yeah. don't even think they had YouTube, you know? So, but today it's game over. They know way yeah. more than their adult parents. No, a hundred percent. I agree with you. So you guys created something called mini Marche, which I would love to learn a little bit more about and then understand also, you know, there was a very small chance of brands being chosen for this mini Marche. So what went into the process of product selection? I, I love this. I'm incredibly proud of this program. So the impetus of it was that during COVID, my team was my team of buyers whose job it is to go out and buy. And, you know, at Indigo, we were very much were looking for innovative products and interesting and fun and new brands that you couldn't find anywhere else at mass. And so when my team was completely grounded in COVID, stuck in their homes, no trade shows, no comp shopping, no international travel, um, we were really kind of perplexed as to where we were going to find these products. And so uh, I came up with this idea uh, with my team to launch a program called Mini Marche. And and the idea was to basically have a casting call to businesses who were Canadian, who were um, you know small, who were often women-led or BIPOC or LGBTQ brands that were you know don't often get the opportunity to be seen and heard, let alone be carried at big, a big brand uh, retailer like Indigo. And so we went out and uh, did a big casting call. We got so much interest. There was so much love for it. And we then have to had to sift through as a team and figure out who we were, how we were going to finalize uh, the, the best sure products the that we thought. the number of people who applied was huge and endless, right? That must have been a huge. We had hundreds. We had hundreds, hundreds of people. Um, and we really, we didn't know how it would go. So we, we didn't actually, I, I didn't want to cap it. Um, yeah. But we had to ha create some kind of, uh, you know, com you know, parameters around it. Um, but we were really thrilled with the, um, the the interest and the variety. There were a lot of baby products um, that I find there were a lot of small businesses in the baby space that were interested and we were growing into Go Baby at the time. So it made perfect sense. Um, and there were also a lot of really great kids products. And so in terms of the process, we accepted all uh, applications. The requirement was essentially that you would meet one of those criteria as well as being Canadian and uh, had an Instagram presence because we wanted to be able to quickly get an idea of your branding, your brand voice and how you communicated with your customers as well as your following to see if you have a following. Uh, but that was not a prerequisite. It wasn't a prerequisite to have a following, but it was right. a prerequisite to have um, an Instagram page. Um, and then we basically narrowed it down based on the kind of categories that we were looking to fill. Again, as as buyers, we we have the categories that we want to participate in. We know where there's opportunity in white space, and so we were looking to fill those gaps. And then we scheduled kind of Shark Tank like um, meetings that went over the course of a week. And my team and I, depending on whose category it was, um, met with each of these uh, finalists and um, interviewed them really quickly to kind of also understand what their story was. It was so beautiful. It was honestly like tear jerking that we had wow. people who lost their job in COVID and started this new business. We had people, you know, stay at home moms who we had a mom who uh, whose child was in the, um, you know, was born premature and needed softer material for a washcloth, like oh, wow. really beautiful, beautiful stories. A woman yeah. who had been laid off after 29 years at uh, a big, a big company and didn't know what to do. And so started this incredible, um, you know, just sweet business. So they were some really special businesses that we never would have found out about if yeah. it wasn't yeah. for this program. So and, and, is, and then, for, and then that's the amazing. Like 
got listed, I'm got sorry, listed yeah. in store. No, no, I was just saying, and then the finalists got listed in store and online. So it was a real happy story. I mean, I think it's brilliant because you're so right. There are these brands that appear out of nowhere and it's, you know, the necessity that appears that allows you to think, okay, this is a product I need to create. But at the same time, not having the budgets that big national brands have, how do you get that in front of the consumers? It is such a daunting challenge and you kind of start feeling I know with the brands that we've worked with we work with so many startup brands and they're like this is completely overwhelming like I don't have tens of thousands of dollars to invest in marketing and getting in front of these buyers and even to your point you know you guys were looking at their social accounts I know a lot I know the big retailers tend to look at social accounts for brand new products and those brand new products are perplexed with okay well if I can't get on shelf then how am I going to build this great following? So I love that you said it didn't matter if they had a big following. It mattered that they had a uh, a, um, a profile because at least you could see how they were interacting. There, there's so many challenges when yeah. you are developing a new brand. So I think I was really excited to hear about Mini Marche because I feel like it was such a unique opportunity for all of these companies to get in front of you guys, to get honest feedback, I don't know. I don't want to know who played the Kevin O'Leary role because I'm sure that... <laughs> we did. We did do that, and that was that was really hard because we we wanted again. We we built such a connection with these yeah. people. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, we had the you know we was it was on Zoom or Teams and and yeah. we talked to them one on one. Oh yeah, I forgot they're, they're doing it over Zoom. They're not even doing it yeah. in person with you. Yeah, it was yeah. so so we but we talked to them and we could meet them and sometimes you know the kids were running through the background because again yeah. it was the middle of COVID and everybody's life was crazy yeah. and so we really got to know them and it was important to us especially I remember there were several several businesses that were really on the cusp of getting in but that we didn't we couldn't accept for right. whatever reason right. um that I, I i remember specifically there was one that was um she was she had a great product but she was overpriced she was just right. out, out, out of mind yeah. uh, and yeah. and it, not and i i wouldn't like i'm sure it was a result of um her costs yeah. um or they it, also incorporate was, sweat equity into that on like startup entrepreneurs always take the cost Plus their sweat equity and yeah. add it on until they figure out, oh, this isn't selling. I need to lower that price, right? Absolutely. And then, and I think in that in that particular case, I remember perhaps it was the the cost that was quite high because her um, units were so small. But yeah. uh, she thought a little too highly of her product. Right. And it was not going to revolutionize the world. Right. It was cute. It was nice. It was special. But it, she had priced herself completely out of the market. And so we had a little bit of tough love with her. And I think that's a good buyer's job. I think if you're a good mm -hmm. buyer, you're honest with your vendor because you want the best for them. And if they don't know, because nobody will tell them, and if everybody just keeps saying, oh, that's so great, but I won't right? list you, yeah. then how is that helpful to anybody? Yeah. So we definitely gave a little bit of tough love of, um, yeah, you need to bring this price down. And and I think actually in that particular case, we did. We said, if you can get to this price, we right. will consider you. And she declined it. She, right. she, she thought it was too low. So, and that's okay. And, yeah. and that's her journey. So, um, but I think some tough love is required. And I think people generally want to hear the truth, especially from yeah. people who know what they're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting because this week we had, you know, obviously we test products on a regular basis and we get feedback, honest feedback from the families who test the products. And then we provide that feedback to the brands. So there was a brand I was really excited about. I thought they were going to do fabulously well. And the feedback was abysmal. So I always hate that call or that email that I have to make to let them know that their product has not earned the seal of approval. And I sent them the email and I heard nothing. So four days later, I followed up and I heard nothing. And I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad because it was pretty yeah. brutal. And they wrote me back a couple of days ago saying, we are so sorry that we did not respond, but we took all of this research straight to our R&D team. And they have been working day and night to address all of the things that your users highlighted to us. Because ultimately, it's 
only going to help us sell more product if our product does what we need it to do. And this product mm -hmm. has some software, so it allowed them to upgrade the app and things like that. And they were like, this insight is brilliant because in a couple of months from now, we're coming back to test this again, and we know it's going to be where the parents want it. So all that to say, the tough love is incredibly valuable because that tough love is based on experience, right? And if you want to sell more mm -hmm. product, you need to deliver on the expectations that consumers ultimately are looking for. Absolutely. I got goosebumps when you told that story. That's really yeah. exciting when people take it seriously. Yeah. And it reminds me of uh, when I was at Spin Master and we were working on um, Air Hogs at the time. Yeah. And uh, it, for anybody who doesn't know, Air Hogs is like a, an air, a remote control airplane that um, you buy for your kids and some adults. Um, and the, the, the team came to me because we had an incredibly high return rate. And sales were phenomenal, but returns were also high. And so we proceeded to do a, a bunch of research from, again, product testing, like you mentioned, to, um, to just a a understand really, really deeply what was happening with the customer. And because the impact was of the returns was significant. There was yeah. impact to um, d relationships with retailers. There was impact at the co costs in the call center. There was impact on shipping. There was just all of these added costs. Forget the, the added you know, danger of disappointing yeah. your customer who may never buy from you again, um, but there were just costs to the business. And so you really don't want to ignore that. And we ended up doing a, a complete overhaul on the brand and improving it exactly like you said at, at the point of production, at, throughout the instructions, um, we changed the age on the package, the recommended age, because we found that it was too low and we were actually getting the wrong consumer, right. um, as well as the instructions were not detailed enough and there weren't extra parts the way they're supposed to be. Like it was a complete overhaul and it's right. in a much better place now. Um, but I think it's so, so important to listen to your customers because they're the ones that are gonna give it to you straight, yep. for sure. And sometimes buyers like might not, but customers will. Absolutely. And ironically, we worked with Spin Master just on a handful of products, but Air Hogs was actually one of the early products mm -hmm. that we work with Spin Master on testing, getting the feedback. I think ultimately they earned the seal of approval, but yeah, so mm -hmm. very small world. There you go. Um, okay. <laughs> so I think all of this has been incredibly valuable because we're always trying, you know, the the people who listen to this like I said before, they're trying to figure out how do I launch a brand? Is it impossible? Is it impossible to get in front of the right buyers? How do I create the right product? What things do I need to take into consideration? So I think your insights have been incredibly valuable. Um, so now I want to take a completely different approach and move away from business and Something that we like to ask our guests towards the end of the podcast is a little bit more personal. So here is kind of a random question for you. But when you were eight years old, what did you want to be when you grew up? Because I'm pretty sure Omni Channel was not in that title description. It was not. It was not. I, um, well, my job, um, preferences would uh, change depending on whatever show I was watching. Right. And so I remember, so I remember at eight, I actually wanted to be a dentist. And then I got a whole bunch of fillings and that, that passed, um, <laughs> that interest disappeared. Um, then I remember wanting to be um, uh, in advertising. I, that was my, my goal. Then I wanted to be a lawyer. And so depending on what show I was into, that was going to be, uh, that was going to be what I was going to do. I love it. I love it. I mean, I was quite honestly going to be married to Rob Lowe. It didn't matter what I was going to do. It was just going to be me and Rob Lowe for the rest of Rob. our lives. So yeah, <laughs> no, but it was all based on the shows, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and my very last question for you, and I, I really believe in paying it forward. And at, before we started this um, recording, we were talking about volunteering and things like that that you're doing now. But what is the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for you, whether it's personally or professionally? Because I hope it'll inspire our listeners to pay it forward as well. 
I think it's a, such a such a great question, and I I love that you're asking it. I think um, I mean professionally, I've had a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities where people have taken a chance on me. I've had multiple people in my life who have changed the trajectory of my career um, by seeing past the title and seeing, you know, trying to understand who I am and what my skills are and what I can bring to the table. And, and I'm forever grateful to, to these people. Um, and so that would be on the professional side. And on the personal side, I think just compassion, just, you know, people who understand understand that you're everybody's going through something and you don't even know yeah. what is happening to a person and uh you know whether it's seeing somebody you know letting somebody through in line because maybe they're in a more of a rush than you are or letting someone in you know uh while you're driving because they yeah. seem to be more stressed than you are i just think kindness goes a long way I, I just in everyday that. things uh, and i think so i love that because it's basic it's to the point and it's something that the world really needs today, right? I think yeah. we take for granted how these little um, displays of compassion can really impact someone's day, how someone's feeling about themselves and it takes so little to so do little. any of those small things, right? And mm -hmm. it really can have an incredible impact. and. You know, the people who took chances on you, I was saying the other day, like I, I, I put up a post about how I am inventing World Mentor Appreciation Day, because I feel like there's, there's a reason we got to where we got. And that is through the assistance of others, people giving us a chance or people really willing to give their time to help us progress. And I think those people deserve so much um, so much recognition. And I know you're trying to do that now as well with people that you're able to mentor. So I love that you're paying it forward. And I hope our listeners are going to take, you know, if you take nothing else out of this pod, this interview and go just to this last question on how you can positively influence other people's lives, I hope you will remember that compassion is incredibly important. Gail Vanek, thank you so much for the taking the time to chat with us today to help educate. Um, you can all find her on LinkedIn. We will post her profile. Um, so uh, Gail, uh, you may be inundated with lots of questions based on all of your amazing experience. And thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, Sharon. My pleasure.